So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Joseph McHale from Mayo Scottsdale, who's going to be speaking on, I've been diagnosed with WM, what now? Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be here. I uh, appreciate the invitation very much. As some of you know, I get a chance to give one or two talks a year. And uh, I gave a talk yesterday morning in Acapulco. So I thought to myself, two international vacation destinations in two days, Acapulco and Dallas. <laughs> so I uh, jumped at the opportunity to be here, but thank you. No, I, um, I honestly... Uh, do give probably 100 talks a year, but my favorite talks, genuinely, I'm not just saying it to give brownie points, um, are to patients. And to be able to be here with you today is, a, is an honor, is a privilege to see this number of you representing what we heard was a rare disease uh, is remarkable. Um, and I would argue, as I'm sure you'll hear from Ken Anderson tonight and many others, we are at a genuine turning point in the world of Waldenstrom's. And I haven't genuinely been able to say that for the last decade because we had a couple advances here and there, but I would suggest now understanding the disease better, developing better drugs, developing strategies to care for patients uh, for a longer period of time is absolutely what we're starting to see in Waldenstrom's, and I'm delighted to see it, and I commend you for just being here. The fact that you're here is in and of itself going to empower you for what's to come. So I've been asked to give the, the kind of my, the, uh, the, the Waldenstrom's 101 talk, you know. So I've been diagnosed with Waldenstrom's, what happens now? So for some of you, this is, as according to the standing and sitting earlier, for some of you, this has been a very recent event. For some of you, apparently last century, this occurred. Uh, nonetheless, I would strongly suggest that going over the basics very often is helpful to us because we can forget them. For those of you, I look out and I see some of you have... have uh, are my patients and have, uh, have seen me in the clinic, I really take a lot of time. I have a very fancy piece of paper on the wall, nothing too electronic, but, and I just walk through the basics of the disease because understanding this disease is going to be a critical piece for you moving forward. You're probably gonna understand it better than most of the physicians who take care of you, frankly, because it's such a rare condition. And so taking ownership of your disease is something that I hope to emphasize as we go through. So, in terms of formal objectives, I just want to review the basics of Waldenstrom's and how it's distinguished from myeloma and lymphoma. I mean, even us, amongst us Waldenstrom's geeks, we have debates and discussions about some patients. I just reviewed uh, an article written on the plane uh, about a, a, paper, a paper that was written trying to help further distinguish uh, Waldenstrom's from other kinds of lymphoma. So one of the things that, that right off the start we're going to have to understand is that the disease does not have an absolute tight concrete diagnosis. There are overlaps with other conditions and understanding that I think will be helpful to you. We'll talk about the importance of an accurate diagnosis on that same vein, that there are patients, I've seen patients who unfortunately were given uh, a lymphoma-like diagnosis or even a or myeloma-like diagnosis when in fact the whole time they had had Waldenstrom's. We'll highlight the critical features establishing the need to treat. And this is again something, if you're not familiar with it, that it, it kind of goes a little bit against the grain. We're not used to this notion of saying, oh, you've got this cancer, but we're not gonna treat you. And I said, pardon, right? I mean, what, what's going on here? But, but you know, you would never say to a woman with breast cancer, oh, let's just see if it grows, because you know it's gonna grow, right? I mean, to make light of a serious disease, but, but Waldenstrom's, as with myeloma and certain kinds of lymphoma, because very often they're not very aggressive and they're not actually hurting you, they're present, but they're not damaging you, we may just leave it alone. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's important because I have some patients who I've followed with Waldenstrom's now for, for over a decade and they've received no treatment. And uh, no disrespect to all the great new treatments that we have, but my favorite treatment is no treatment, right? What I call nada. I'll give you lots of nada. It's got a good price. It's got a good side effect profile. Um, <laughs> And of course, it can come with worry, and so we have to make sure we navigate that. But more often than not, if it's a little bit, as I call it, a little bit of dust sitting in the corner that's actually not hurting the room, you don't necessarily have to get the power vac out to take care of that little bit of dust. And so we'll talk about when we treat the disease. And then we'll look at, very briefly at the overall approach. And then hopefully, um, if anything, that I want to kick off this conference with you is to empower you for your disease career, if I can call it that. 
um, that knowledge is power in this condition, support is power in this condition. Look at the support that you have here. It's genuinely remarkable. Uh, and so I hope to be a small part of that. So the brief version, if you want to nap for the next 30 minutes or so, um, is, is as follows. Learn as much as you can, as I've said, because that's power. Track. Track your own results. Now, I don't necessarily need you to do what some of my patients do where they come in with these like 3D tables in color, tracking their you know, blood work, every aspect of their blood work, correlating it to their Aquarius or Capricorn status. You know, I mean, there, there's some detail that's a little over the top, but again, in a day in which medical records are more accessible and available to you, obviously uh, in the context of your confidentiality and privacy, uh, I think it is incumbent on you. And, and one of the things you'll see is a Wallenstrom's is an unusual condition. And that I can have a patient come in and their IgM level can shoot up one month and then drop the next month and we haven't done anything. There's, there's a natural variation to this condition. And so very often you might hear your physicians or your providers say, oh, well, let's just check it again in another month because it can bobble like a bobblehead. And we can see that with the IgM level. And so helping track your results can empower you. Advocate for yourself and others. Just the fact that you're here, of course, does that, no doubt. Discuss with your providers the options. You know, the days of saying, here, dear, take this pill, I'm your doctor, trust me, hopefully are gone, right? We, this is a, a, a condition that is not very simple. You know, we have our International Wallenstrom's Working Group and we meet together to develop consensus. And it depends how you define consensus. The consensus is, here are all the different options. So it's very challenging to say, uh, this is exactly how we treat Wallenstrom's first line, second line. I'll give you examples of that later. And I'm not trying to be your mother here, but comply with the therapy. Um, part of that comes with the discussion. You know, part of my work actually is, is trying to understand physician-patient communication skills. And we've come to demonstrate that if you have a good relationship with your provider, you're gonna be more open and honest with them and be able to share your symptoms and the challenges that you have and why or why not you, you, may, you may not be taking your medication. Uh, and so that itself, I think, can help in that situation. Report back your symptoms and your sentiments. Don't just say, well, I guess this, this is the treatment that the doctor's giving me and I'll take it and I will like it, right? That is not the way we wanna do it. Oh no, I don't have any numbness and tingling in my hands and my feet. Really, no, everything's fine. Um, and again, not to make light of peripheral neuropathy for those of you who have experienced it, but it's important to make sure that you relate that. And then lastly, and this is a bit of the hold hands, sing kumbaya moment of my talk, but we want you to take ownership of your disease. The fact that you're here is facilitating that, of course, because it's yours. Although I do remember I had a patient who sadly has passed away now, and she used to tell me, don't call it my disease because it's not mine. It's just invading my body. Uh, so it was quite interesting the way she said that. But, but I think the concept here of saying you're taking ownership, you're not just leaving it to others to manage it, I think is going to help you. All right. Well, let's just go back to the ultimate basics. Now, please don't mistake this for being criticism of Dr. Maury Gertz, because Maury, Maury was one of the reasons why I came to Mayo Clinic. I still remember him uh, working very hard to help recruit me between he and Dr. Kyle, uh, so blame them that I'm at Mayo. Uh, but they were a very big part of me coming to Mayo. But, but Maury is tomorrow gonna give you the garden talk, all right? So make sure you listen to the garden talk. It's a great talk. But my point is, why go to the garden? when you can go to the vineyard. Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you, right? <laughs> so you might just wanna mention that gently to Dr. Gertz tomorrow. So, so Dr. Gertz gives this great analogy of the garden and weeds in the middle of the garden. It's, I mean, I laugh, I cry every time I hear it. It's fantastic. But I'd rather talk to you about the vineyard, the wine. So I want you to think of your blood cells as white, red and rosé, okay, you with me? So I actually don't really drink that much anyway, but my point is that uh, that's a way to remember it. So you have, you've got red cells, those are the, the red, those are the cells that carry oxygen. I get offend every hematologist in the world right now, but they're just little red trucks. I mean, that's all they do. They come to your lungs, they pick up the oxygen you've just breathed in, they go deliver them to the tissues, drop it off, come back for more. Pick up, drop off, pick up, drop, that's all your red cells really do. White cells are a little bit more complex. They're like soldiers in an army protecting you. And when I give talks to our medical students, I talk about the five branches of the military, and similarly, there are five kinds of white cells, and they're just a part, actually, of the bigger immune system, but they're a critical piece, and they're much like soldiers. They're big ones or small ones. Some fight on the front lines, some stay at headquarters, some engage in battle, some just support the troops. 
uh, that's how your body is protected. And one of the challenges you'll understand with Waldenstrom's is Waldenstrom's is a cancer of some of those immune cells. That's why diseases like Waldenstrom's are so challenging because the soldiers that are there, or the police officers that are there to protect you are the ones that turn on you. And that's why it's different than most solid tumors where the very one who's meant to help you is hurting you makes it more uh, challenging. That's why when people say, oh, can't, don't I just need something to boost my immune system because I'm a cancer patient? We want to be careful that we're not boosting the wrong part of the immune system, right? If you've got a problem in your police force where some cops are good and some are bad, right? I know it's a difficult week to talk about that, and I don't mean to, uh, you know, I, I honestly don't mean to, to, to point fingers by any means. I, I've been used, for those who know me, I've been using this analogy for a long time. But you don't just say, let's have more police officers in that context, because you don't know if you're, if you're boosting the ones that are helping or those that are hurting. hurting. So beware of the, the notion that may be out there that says, oh, you're a cancer patient, we better boost your immune system. Well, there are parts of it we do, but parts of it we want to be careful with. And then lastly, you've got the rosé cells, or what we call platelets. And platelets are just the cells that help you clot. I call them the ambulance, because if I were to cut myself, the first ones on the scene are platelets, because they're circulating all the time. They get there, and they squeeze themselves into the cut, and they plug it up. That's what we call a platelet plug. And then they make a phone call to their friends that are called factors, to come and, st and form a really strong blood clot. So when people have factor problems, they have more worrisome bleeding like hemophilia and so on. But the ambulance or, or the, the uh, pl uh, platelets are the first ones to get there. And all of these are produced in the factory of your blood. And many of you know this because you've undergone the testing, uh, what we call the bone marrow. And there's a little picture for the visual learners. Well, the rest of your blood system, that's what's inside it. But the blood flows, as you know, generally speaking, arteries flow away from the heart and veins flow back uh, to the heart. And I like to think of those like roads in the city. So you've got a couple of roads here in Dallas, don't you? You, know, you can think of the huge network of concrete. Seriously, is there anything but concrete here? But sorry. Um, concrete and country music, two of my favorite things. Anyway, um, <laughs> I did give a talk at Mayo a few weeks ago, and I found an old abstract. This is like the wrong place to say this. But um, I found this old paper that was published that had correlated listening to country music to increased rates of suicide. <laughs> and so I showed it as kind of a little bit of a joke to say, you know, for those of you who love country music, I'm sorry that you love country music. But um, so anyway, I, I, I am so getting on that plane out of here later today. But <laughs> before I get attacked by the, the Texans, but anyway. Um, so think of the roads of a city, but then underneath the roads, you've got like this uh, a much smaller sewer-like system, and that's what we think of as the lymphatic system, and that's going to be important in understanding Waldenstrom's a little bit because it's going to correlate to uh, lymphomas and so on. And this is where a lot of your white cells live. So the white cells do circulate in the blood, of course, but then many of them spend quite a bit of time going through this lymphatic system, and they're little stations to this uh, underground system uh, that we call lymph nodes. And many of them are normal and they're meant to be there of a certain size, but when they become abnormal or when you become sick, they can grow. And that's the challenge is are they growing because, oh, this is, uh, I've, I've gotten bitten by a mosquito and I, my white cells are appropriately coming to try and defend my body against it, or are those white cells gone bad themselves and are growing out of control? All right. And here's a picture of the blood vessels and, and the lymphatic system so that you can learn it, so that you can uh, see it visually. Now, protein diseases, which is the ones we're now coming to, are diseases of so-called plasma cells. Plasma cells are the cells that make your antibodies or that make your uh, good proteins that help you fight off infections. If I give my good friend here, Jim, in the front row, uh, a tetanus shot, well, I'm not really giving him tetanus. What I'm doing is I'm training his body to know what tetanus is in the off chance that he steps on a rusty nail and gets infected with tetanus. Well, I don't need to leave the needle in his arm for the rest of his life. That would be somewhat irritating, right? So what happens when I give him that shot, it sends a message to the plasma cells. The plasma cells responding by, respond by making an antibody or an against body, that's what the word really means, an antibody directed against tetanus that we keep in reserve until such time as we may step on that rusty nail. Well, that same machinery is what goes wrong. And plasma cells, like in a disease like multiple myeloma, which is really a disease exclusively of the plasma cell, as we'll come to understand Waldenstrom's, is a disease that involves the plasma cell, but also involves uh, other lymph cells, as we call it. 
Um, and in that situation of myeloma, those, my, those plasma cells make a very abnormal protein. So instead of making a good antibody that fights, you, uh, fights off tetanus, it now makes a bad antibody, what we call monoclonal or M protein or M spike because of the way it looks in the lab. And that M protein can do damage to the body and crack bones and attack the kidney and do various other things. And so the buildup of these bad proteins can damage organs and bones and kidneys as you see from here. So there's a spectrum of these diseases. There's lots of them. We classically think of them in, as myeloma being one category. Then there's a category that uh, where the protein actually itself undergoes a conformational change and deposits itself into organs. And that classically is a disease called amyloidosis. And then thirdly, we have these little less, un, these little, uh, uh, sorry, less common diseases like Waldenstrom's uh, where there's a bit of an overlap. So if we look at it uh, pictorially, there's multiple myeloma, and we have the aspects of myeloma we call a spectrum myeloma. There's something called MGUS, which was coined, uh, the phrase monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance was coined by Dr. Kyle himself. And then there's something called smoldering myeloma, which is kind of a pre-myeloma condition. So there's the myeloma, but then we add amyloid to it, then we add Waldenstrom's and poems. So there have features that overlap together, but they're distinct diseases. And part of that has to do with the way these white cells uh, and these plasma cells uh, mature through the bone marrow. Now, I'm not gonna give you some boring scientific lecture, but most of your bone marrow cells, um, uh, the, the, what we call the, the white cells, rather the B cells, because they start in the bone marrow, they live in the bone marrow for a while, kind of like they're at home, all right? And then they go off to school or go off to college, which is the lymph node, right? I'm totally denigrating the lymph node, but um, they go off to college and they mature there. <clears throat> Sorry, just clearing my throat. And so they mature in college. And then, of course, there are some of those white cells that come back home and live with mommy and daddy, right? So, so there are certain cells that come back, but there are others that never come back, <laughs> that always stay uh, away from home. So that's kind of what happens in the maturation of your uh, white cells, of these key cells. And at every point along the line, those white cells can become cancerous. And that's the problem. They can, get, they can be cancerous early on, when they're in the bone marrow, which turns into many leukemias. They can get cancerous when they're out in the lymph node, which is mostly the lymphomas because they're in the lymphatic system. And then there are ones that when they come back into the bone marrow that become plasma cells that can turn into myeloma. Now I've really simplified blood cancer right here, but cancers that start in the bone marrow originally become leukemias. Those in the, in the lymph nodes become lymphomas. Those that come back into the marrow become myelomas. As we'll see in a moment though, where does Waldenstrom's fit in there? Well, it fits in there because it's, it's literally an overlap of myeloma and lymphoma. It has features that are consistent with myeloma, that there's a plasma-like cell involved, but there's also a lymphoma-like cell involved. And so when I teach our residents and fellows about this, I put it this way so that they can see the overlap of the two. In fact, as you know, Waldenstrom's can be called a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, right? Like when you don't know, just add more phrases to the word, right? So it's a lymphoplasma cell. So you got lymph and plasma cells together. And, and indeed, when you, if you've read your pathology reports, I know they're absolutely riveting when you read them, but if you read your pathology reports and the, the pathologist may say something like, these are plasma cells with lymphocytic differentiation or lymph, lymph, uh, or lymphocytes with plasmacyte differentiation or lymphoplasmacytic cells. The concept is they're two cells that, are, that we know are different, but they share properties together and some of them can, if you will, overlap like this. Now, what about your blood tests in myeloma? I don't wanna go through this in a lot of detail, but you, got, you have three major classes of blood tests uh, that when I see my patients and I see them both at diagnosis and follow-up, we talk about the three tests we wanna look at. The first are the basic blood counts, the second are the chemistry, and the third are some very specific protein tests that are important. So the first, the CBC, as we mentioned already, the white, red, and the rosé become important all the way along. We wanna make sure if your factory, you know, if the factory of your bone marrow is so uh, dedicated to making bad lymphoplasmacytic cells, then it's not making the other good things. And this is the garden analogy that you'll hear a little bit more tomorrow. If there are a lot of weeds in the garden, you're not gonna make as many good, uh, good fruits or vegetables. 
So similarly, we watch these numbers because a low hemoglobin in particular, or red blood cell count, is one of the hallmarks of Waldenstrom's. When we know there's more than just a little bit of dust in the corner, there's enough growth of the disease that it's actually impairing the person. And uh, so sometimes we can see patients that have 30, 40, 50, 60, 80. I had a patient the other day, literally 100% of their bone marrow was dedicated to these unfortunate lymphoplasmacytic cells. So you can imagine, they're not making very good grass, right? They're not making you know, any good, uh, good part of the bone marrow, they're just making the bad part. The other things, in case you want to be a bit more precise, the size of the red cell matters, what's called the mean corpuscular volume, or MCV. And then the different kind of white cells. It's not just a question of saying, what's the total white cells? What's the what are the differences within them? Chemistry is important. I know you didn't like it in high school, but chemistry is important. And so there are very basic chemicals that we look through. I'm not going to go through them all. Some of them refer to your kidney function, like creatinine. Others are liver enzymes. One of the, the chemistry tests that's important in, in Waldenstrom's is the viscosity. Because in Waldenstrom's, the abnormal immunoglobulin, or that abnormal protein we've been talking about is the IgM, it's a big one. It's made of five bits. It's five times bigger, essentially, than the IgG molecule. And so if it accumulates in the blood, it makes the blood thicker, if you will, or, or more viscous. And that's one of the reasons why patients can experience symptoms of thick blood. When your blood's not flowing nicely through your vessels, Things like strokes, unfortunately, can happen. It can affect people's vision. It can give people headaches. There are a lot of things that can happen in context of viscosity that you'll be hearing about today. And then there's Waldenstrom specific tests where we do what's called the serum protein electrophoresis, where we're trying to distinguish those good proteins from the bad proteins. You know, the tetanus-like good proteins that you've built in your, in your system to protect you against tetanus versus the bad ones that grow. We look at the absolute number of those proteins as well, including the IgM. And then I may, you may remember I showed you the picture. Those molecules look like funny shaped Ys with a long arm in the middle and little arms on the edges. Those little arms in the edges are called light chains. Now those light chains aren't always abnormal in Waldenstrom's, but they often can be. And it's important to follow them as well. And I've already talked a bit about the viscosity. So when we come to diagnose a patient, more often than not people come in fatigued, or have some kind of weakness. The, IgM monoclonal or abnormal protein is high. More often than not, the anemia is the issue. The low hemoglobin is uni almost universally the problem that we face. People can have enlarged lymph nodes because they're filling up with these unusual white cells that you're now an expert in. People can have what's called neuropathy or numbness or tingling in their hands or feet. To be blunt, we don't really understand why that happens. We just know that all diseases related to the plasma cell and to some degree the lymphocytes can somehow have cross-reactivity to damage nerves. Uh, and so that can happen even before treatment. Sometimes, unfortunately, treatment can even worsen neuropathy. So we want to be careful what kinds of treatments we use. Um, the cells in the bone marrow look, as I've mentioned, this lymphoplasmacytoid. And then there may be the hyperviscosity, as we've discussed, where that IgM level gets so high, the blood is thick, and there are symptoms associated with that. And because white cells and the immune system cells live in the liver and spleen to some degree, sometimes they can be enlarged as well. Well, genes, genes, and more genes. Well, it's not all about what percentage of lymphoplasma cells you have, or even to some degree, how big your IgM is. You know, you don't come to the educational forum and sit down at the break time and say, hey, what's your IgM level? <laughs> how many forums have you been to? <laughs> but, uh, not to make light of your IgM levels by any means, but you know, I can have two patients that both have an IgM level of 2,500 or 3,000. And one of them can be smoldering like dust in the corner and it's not hurting them all. The other person can be very sick with that. So beware of the just total number meaning something. And it goes back to this notion that the cells that produce them can be, if you will, a little bit bad or very bad. Um, and in many respects, um, this bad cop analogy uh, holds. So the absolute percentage isn't, uh, isn't everything. It's a part of it. With that patient of mine who had 80 or 90% uh, involvement of their bone marrow, well, I know that they're going to be sick from that because it's hard for a bone marrow to function with only 5 or 10% activity. But the genes within those cells, and this is one of the major advances, and I know you're going to be hearing more about it, and this is just the introduction talk, so I can't go through a lot of detail, but you're going to hear a little bit about the uh, MYD88 or MID88 gene that has been identified in the majority of patients with Waldenstrom's, and that could be a target. 
If we know that there's a certain gene that's affected that triggers these white cells to do what they do, you know, because cancer cells, what they want is they want to live forever. They're kind of like us in some respects. They just want a really, really long life. So they've overcome the usual mechanisms that your body has to have your cells live for a while and die. And part of that are the way their genetic machinery is affected. So it could be with time, and you'll hear about some of this work this week, that uh, if we can direct therapies to affect that gene, we might be able to care for patients with Waldenstrom's better. So you hear more about that. And that's why you'll find that your doctor might be doing what's called cytogenetics uh, on, the, on the tests that you had in your bone marrow. Well, in the, in the last little bit here, let's talk a little bit about treatment. So um, this was our, again, if you will, consensus group uh, that met to discuss how, what should we, uh, in, what should we suggest to patients and their providers as to when someone should be treated. Because as I mentioned before, it's an unusual condition where there are a lot of people who may not need treatment. In fact, out of the patients here in the crowd, how many of you are currently not on treatment? Yeah, oh. hello. I'll give you a bit more of that nada, all right? Yeah, and, and that's, that's good. So patients can either go for a period of time without needing treatment or even after they've had treatment, go into enough of a remission where they don't need to be treated for a long period of time. This is in contrast to certain other cancers and leukemias uh, and lymphomas even that basically need treatment all the time. So we've tried to come up with, and, and it's tough when you've got a slide like this with all this information on it, but I know you have it on paper more as a reference to you, but there are things that tend to push us to treat, and we put them in two categories. Clinical things, or things that pe patients feel and sense, like being very sick with fevers and night sweats, or the hyperviscosity we've talked about. When someone's, it's not just having a big spleen and a big liver, but they're actually symptomatic or painful, uh, or someone has the peripheral neuropathy that we can really attribute to the Waldenstrom's. By contrast, there are lab things. Now again, I like to say I don't treat lab tests, I treat people but the lab tests can very much affect how you feel. And so if someone has things like a really low hemoglobin count or um, some of these uh, numbers that we've talked about before that are striking, then it may cause us to treat. We have what's called the, the prognostic staging system. And you now to be honest, I don't want us to get too excited about these numbers because they're not really telling us when to treat. We've just been able to look back and say with this database of patients with Waldenstrom's, what features uh, have caused us to, if you will, put someone in a prognostic category where maybe they do need treatment or, or their disease is going to be a little bit more aggressive. And so there are some numbers there. But I put it up just to be complete, but to be very honest, I can speak for all of us in the Waldenstrom's world that we don't really follow these five numbers that uh, dramatically anymore uh, to point us in the direction. So choosing initial therapy then becomes important. So it's not that we treat all Waldenstrom's patients the same way up front. So it, it's going to be influenced. The choice of therapy has got to match the patient, right? We think of personalized or individualized medicine these days. And so the first choice is going to be important. It's going to be the presence of what we call cytopenias or low blood counts, the white, red, and rosé that we've talked about. The need for rapid disease control. Someone's disease going really quickly. For some of you, as you know, your, your IgM is just maybe slowly inching up month after month. For some people, it's literally skyrocketing. We know we've got to get in there and do that. Age influences treatment, because we're not ageist, but we know that some of our patients who are becoming very elderly cannot handle high-powered chemotherapy or a stem cell transplant. So that's gonna influence, and as I've mentioned, candidacy for autologous stem cell transplant. So we don't have this one-size-fits-all approach, or it isn't a cookie cutter with Waldenstrom's. But let me share with you a few key themes that might help us. Rituximab-based therapy is still, generally speaking, the most preferred whether it's rituximab alone or rituximab with something else, the majority of you who received your first line therapy, I would suggest rituximab was somewhat involved. You may not have received it the very first day. They may have wanted to give you some chemotherapy first to bring your IgM number down and so on. But usually now, rituximab is the partner uh, with most therapies for uh, Waldenstrom's. When we need to move quickly because the disease is very aggra aggressive, we tend to use rituximab plus some uh, more intensive chemotherapy, like bendamustine, like CHOP, like a dex, a dexamethasone with cyclophosphamide, are, tend to be the three most used options. I would say that there has been a trend recently towards more therapy with rituximab and bendamustine, but you're gonna hear more about this over the course of the day. 
Cyclophosphamide is a drug that's not particularly toxic and um, as opposed to some of the older drugs we used with Waldenstrom's, it might damage the bone marrow in the long term. But as we've heard, if people are living longer with the disease, I don't want to give you something front line. Hey, maybe it works well, but if it compromises future options, I want to be careful. I always tell patients, this isn't a game, but if it were a game, I want to play the best card for you, but I want to play the card that lets me play the other ones later, if you know what I mean. So the sweet sequence of treatments becomes important. Bortezomib is beneficial in patients, in particular with high viscosity, and if a rapid response is needed. It tends not to be a centerpiece treatment because the response rate is not quite as deep as some of these others, but can be very helpful. Patients with low blood counts may benefit from the RDC, as I've listed there, or uh, RT or, 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 other or other combinations that don't include what's called the nucleoside analogs. You'll hear more about those. Uh, th those are the ones that end in ene, you know, cladribine, uh, and even to some degree bendamustine that can be a little bit tougher on the blood counts. But they may be invaluable in advanced disease because of their efficacy. And we've come to learn that there are some patients, maybe that's, they, they, we can go gently with them, that they only need single agent rituximab or even in some cases the, uh, an older pill that still has activity chlorambucil uh, in certain individuals. I've just given you from the publication last year in blood um, again, how we've tried to characterize them, and I'm not going to go through these, this is more really for your reference uh, of major themes that might influence one treatment over the other. In relapse disease, you're going to hear an outstanding lecture uh, um, this afternoon about uh, relapsed my, uh, Waldenstrom, so I'm not going to steal any uh, thunder, uh, but nonetheless, when we think about relapsing disease, it also, of course, depends on what someone had before, because very often we can go back to something that we used before. Because if it worked well and it worked for a long period of time and someone was into remission for a period of time, we may be able to go back to it. I've already mentioned a little bit about nucleoside analogs. And then, of course, recently we've been very excited about the addition of ibrutinib. And the FDA, uh, the FDA tends not to be vague, but they were almost a little bit vague when they gave us the formal indication excuse me, indication for brutinib, and we're all happy for it because it gives us more flexibility. Because very often when a drug gets approved by the FDA, it's very precise in its use, so it doesn't get overused. But it's kind of hard to overuse a drug in a disease like Waldenstrom's when, as we know, there aren't that many patients, as we've said. So a brutinib is um, a definitely a, a major step forward in Waldenstrom's. I, I always want to temper that with saying it's not the cure, right? I mean, we haven't reached the stage where we're really talking about cure, but we are talking about controlling this disease for much longer. You know, we haven't cured diabetes or high blood pressure either, right? We just control them for a long period of time. And I do hope that we can come to a day where almost every patient with Waldenstrom's has it as a chronic disease, if not ultimately, of course, being cured. Uh, there are other agents that are things like Everolimus. We have these newer versions of rituximab, if you will, or anti-CD20 agents, and so many others in development. Many that are you're going to hear about scientifically today, others that are in clinical trial. I mean, it really is exciting to see many of the options that we have. And often these are drugs that have been tested in a disease like myeloma. And I can tell you the pipeline in myeloma is massive right now of new drugs being tested. And many of those will come to Waldenstrom's. And then uh, we do consider transplant in certain patients who have really high-risk features, uh, who, who um, the disease is becoming so aggressive that it's hard to control otherwise. And as I mentioned before, we can often reuse initial therapy, especially if someone had a duration of response or DOR of greater than 12 months. So I'm not here to, to drink the Kool-Aid too much for Mayo Clinic, um, but we do have um, a website at msmart.org uh, that we've just updated, uh, if you wish to read it, um, where basically we have tried to come up with an approach to uh, give a concept or guidance to uh, providers and patients as to how to treat uh, multiple myeloma and how to treat Waldenstrom's. And so we call it MSMART, the male stratification of macroglobulinemia and risk adaptive therapy. I give you this just as background so you can see how, it's, how we describe it. But this is the key point to show you here is um, how in general we've divided people into three categories. And there's difference of opinion. I always joke, you get 10 Waldenstrom's doctors in a room and you have 12 opinions, right? So get used to it. <laughs> but um, we've basically put people in three categories. 
those patients who have, as I described before, the dust in the corner, where yes, they have the disease, but there's not enough of it that triggers treatment, they can be observed. At the other end of the spectrum, there are people who have disease that makes them quite sick, what we call bulky disease, lots of lymph nodes or big, uh, uh, big uh, liver and spleen, low blood counts, maybe even requiring uh, plasmapheresis for their hyperviscosity. Those patients need more aggressive therapy and we're generally recommending bendamustine rituximab as first line therapy. Obviously there's lots of give there, but this is just a general recommendation. And then there are people in the middle who, it looks like we need to treat you, but your disease is not so aggressive. I don't wanna wait until it becomes aggressive, right? That's part of the challenge of waiting and watching. And sometimes people call it waiting and worrying, right? And, and, and we've gotta watch you closely enough, but it's tough, it's, it's a difficult, thing to do, and it's one of the greatest struggles of our cancer patients, and I don't want to underestimate that. That, you know, you think, oh, is this going to be the visit when I go see my doctor that my M spike or my IgM has gone up? Uh, but on the other hand, we don't want to hurt you by necessarily giving you more treatment than you need. And so in that middle group, we've generally recommended single agent rituximab with some caveats underneath. After people have had their initial treatment, they come back now, to their, uh, to, to unfortunately relapse, then we have some guidance as to whether or not we go back to the original therapy or look at some of these other options which now includes ibrutinib. And it's not to say that ibrutinib, for example, can't be used up front. As I mentioned, the vagueness enough of the indication could allow us to do it, but I think most of us, generally speaking, are not using it up front. There are some upfront trials being done now with rituximab plus ibrutinib, which will inform our discussion about this perhaps by next year. All right, I'm coming to my end. So let me just conclude by saying, look, Waldenstrom's, as we know, still unfortunately has that label of being incurable as a cross between myeloma and lymphoma. But many patients don't require treatment right away and may never require treatment. We have some patients that just, it stays dust in the corner for the rest of their life. Thankfully, when patients do need treatment, there are many options now. And many of them that are milder than the old school Chemotherapy, you know, because you say chemotherapy to the average person on the street, what do they think of? Bald and barf, right? And so, although that can still happen in this condition, thankfully, more often than not, we're not doing that. Understanding your disease is the first step to taking ownership. And I'm obviously biased because I'm giving the understanding your disease talk, right? But I really hope this has been of benefit to you, even if you capture a few pearls and have a better understanding of your condition. And I mean this genuinely for those who have worked with me. My passion in life, of course, are my patients. That all patients should be viewed as individuals, and your treatment has to be tailored to you. You know, you are not a Waldenstrom's patient. You are a person, and you have a name, and your disease uh, is part of you indeed, but you should be treated as a person. And thankfully, more research, uh, research and clinical trials have been great and have brought us to this point, but we need to do a lot more, thankfully, with more progress being made. There are some of the... Um, consultants, some of the physicians that, re that are represented the, through Mayo Clinic uh, that work uh, intensely to try and care for Wallenstrom's patients. And if you ever come to Arizona, you might find some crazy guy driving around with this license plate. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes, so, doctor. You talked about the numbers, and you don't treat the numbers, you treat the patient. And you talked about uh, hemoglobin and some of the other measurements. On the la almost the last slide, you talked about uh, repeat therapy with peripheral neuropathy less than GD2. What is that? Is that a grading of how severe peripheral neuropathy is? That slide there. Is that a grading, of, and how do you grade that? Oh, so yes. So peripheral neuropathy, had, just I pulled it up so people would see it. So. We have a classification system uh, that's actually common throughout all cancers to grade certain side effects. We can even grade nausea, we can grade diarrhea, I know that sounds really attractive, uh, but we can grade neuropathy. And, and classically, the way neuropathy is graded is, uh, per, grade one neuropathy is where there is some numbness and tingling, but you're still able to do all your regular activity. Grade two, it's starting to affect your ability to do things. By grade three, it's severely affecting or is painful. So in this recommendation, we've said that we're uh, okay with going back if someone's got pre-existing neuropathy that's less than two, so just grade one. If someone has more than grade two neuropathy, we have to look at other options. Thank you. I think we have a question here. 
or are we bringing the mic? Thank you. Feel like Jerry Springer? Jerry, Jerry. Yeah, so on that chart, doctor, you have, uh, if it's more than four years since a previous therapy, repeat the original. On a chart earlier, you had after 12 months, and that, that seems significant difference for yeah, someone that's already you, through the first You saw time. that number, did you? <laughs> Awkward party of one. Um, <laughs> We, we had a lot of discussion about that. That is, um, I do think the four years is too long, to be honest. I think part of the idea was that um, someone has responded for that period of time, but usually very often then they're on a drug holiday for a while. It's pretty unusual for Waldenstrom's patients to just go from treatment to treatment to treatment. Very often they can get a period of time off, and I think that's what was trying to be captured here. I guess the way to think about it is, um, in sort of more pragmatic terms is, what is your gut feeling when I say, let's go back to treatment A again, right? How did people feel about it, about how, what their side effects were? Because the, the principle is that whatever you had the first time, if, if, the, if you had something that worked this long the first time, generally speaking, the second time, it's about two thirds that length, sometimes even a bit less. So do we wanna do this again to only get X number of months? when we had this number of months the first time. I think we'll have to cut it off now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.